Welcome to the Small Business Wake Up Call, the twice weekly podcast that will open your eyes to the kinds of insights you can use to better run your business. Come have your morning, Joe, with hosts Lonnie Shambi and Stan Simpkins, who have the right recipes and ingredients to easily help you cook up a storm for even your toughest competitor. No lectures, no wasting your time telling you how smart they are, and no bullshit. The Small Business Wake Up Call is going to make you think, laugh, and help you recognize how much money you've been leaving on the table with advice that'll help you improve your quality of life. Lonnie and Stan are small business veterans who will share their individual war stories and experiences, not only from their own businesses, but also from guiding hundreds of other small business owners in over 100 industries. Head on over to sbvirtualroundtables.com where you can connect with Lonnie and Stan and save yourself some headaches. Grab that second cup of joe, or maybe something a bit stronger, and let's see what's on the menu for today. Welcome to the Small Business Wake Up Call, and here are your hosts, with cups in hand, Lonnie Shambi and Stan Simpkins. Welcome to this next chapter of our podcast. I'm Lonnie Shambi, and with my partner, Stan Simpkins, we're going to continue our in-depth review of the five M's. Manpower, management team, marketing and sales, money, Machine and Systems, the first three of which we presented in our previous podcast, as well as the overriding M, Mindset, that affects each one. Today, Stan and I are going to talk about money. But more than money, we're going to talk about cash flow, profitability, and quality of life. Quality of life? Yes, Dan. Can you say stress? Oh. Hey, you see, you see how excited he is? Just the very mention of money has Stan, a, a recovering accountant in another life, salivating. But we think it's more than just accounting or working with your accounting firm. It's about how you manage your company's money, not just day to day, but long term. All the M's are important, but money, how you generate it, manage it, raise it, is the lifeblood of business. And as I've noted, the stress associated with money. So with this one, so much of it in his wheelhouse, here's my partner, Stan Simpkins, to show you the way. Oh, Lonnie, you know you love to talk about coaching, sales, and cause that's what you came from. But while I'm a CPA, in fact, I decided to become a CPA at age 15, I can honestly say it's not my passion to coach people in accounting, which I actually did as a volunteer in college for high school students but rather helping small business owners who have as much interest in accounting as I have fixing my car. And by the way, if there's three ways to do it, I'll find nine to do it wrong. If that gives you any sense of my interest level or ability for that matter. Spoken like a true bean counter. Hey, you know, Lonnie, some people, especially accountants, could be offended by that term bean counter. (laughs) But I'll take that as a compliment. (laughs) But since you threw it out, Let me say that today's conversation is not about being able to do the numbers, but rather to interpret what they mean. To get like a coach out in the football field waving signals and all that, you know, to get an indicator as to where you're going and what you might want to do about it. Most importantly, I might add, what I'm hoping we'll do today, and I know you'll talk about this, especially from a sales standpoint, the art or science, if you will, of forecasting. Not the Ouija poor kind, but from actual evidence, if you will. So I'm hoping that we'll get into that conversation about forecasts and projections, which, by the way, are different. Do you know the difference between a forecast and a projection? Yes. One's a wish, (laughs) one's a dream. (laughs) (laughs) So a forecast, we'll talk a little accounting here, is something that you create based upon some precedent, past sales, backlog, knowledge of changes in customer base, things like pricing changes, et cetera. And that's a forecast. And that's what banks want to see when you're seeking money. On the other hand, you have projections, which are not a bad thing, but those are more like you say, wishes. And they have a purpose. The good news is, for our listeners, this podcast is not going to be about accounting or bookkeeping, because I think even that would put Lonnie to sleep. And he doesn't sleep well as it is. So, (laughs) (laughs) Oh, oh, but Stan, you'll have me snoring by mid-podcast, I'm sure. (laughs) I've caught you a few times in our conversation, so it doesn't take that long, actually. (laughs) So why are we addressing the subject of accounting, Lonnie? Because being able to analyze your financials beyond the raw numbers is as powerful to a business owner 
as the technologies that are available to physicians, doctors, if you will, the medical field, as MRIs, X-ray machines, CAT scans, and God knows what else we have today that you and I didn't have the privilege of getting. And I, as a cancer survivor, having had prostate cancer, I cannot thank my lucky stars that these machines are around because our parents didn't have them. And yet we have these tools for small business owners, and they don't use them. And that's why you and I are coaches, because we don't want to see people suffering unnecessarily. And beyond suffering, just holding back the potential they have. The fact that people look at accounting and accountants as kind of the guy who- You can say it bean counters. Well, they're bean counters, but guys who are telling me what happened three months ago, I could be out of business by now, and they wouldn't have known until they ask for my financials or they ask for my QuickBooks. It's, no, no, that's not the way to do it. And what Stan's going to be talking about today is much more than that. We're going to talk about leakage. No, 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 not the kind that's related to prostate cancer. No, no, no. We're going to talk about leakage. Can I give you a live war story here? Sure. So I had this client, I can't mention the industry, but let's say they went into homes and made them better. We'll just say it that way. I'm not going to say whether it's windows or who knows what it is, but they made them better. And there was a value proposition, the potential for savings. For the longest time, I, in, in analyzing their numbers, I said, your cost of sales, specifically materials, keeps going up percentage-wise. You know, like what's going on? Like our material costs increasing and you weren't able to pass them on in your quotes or, you know, what's going on? He said, no, I'm not doing anything differently. And it took three years, I hate to say, of working with this client and really growing the business, but I wasn't seeing the margin increases I was hoping for. And I said, I'm done with this. Something's wrong. Because as you know, Lonnie, Theft of property, theft of time, theft of use of equipment owned by the company, by employees, is huge. Small business owners don't know they're a theft waiting to happen between drugs, addictions, and all kinds of, and hating your boss. Especially when you've got lower paid labor and the like, it almost comes with the territory sometimes. Well, I'm going to take exception to that. It's not necessarily the lower paid. I wouldn't want to suggest that that, quote, class of employee is more susceptible because you have executives pulling it off. So let's be fair. Oh, but, yeah. Yeah, you're right. You're tempting the people who are actually having access to the, you know, if some CEO or CFO wanted to go into the warehouse and take some things, I'd kind of like wonder. But it wouldn't make me wonder if one of the employees who had access to it, who was doing that kind of work, did it. And that's where it happens. Oh, yeah. I got a client who went through exactly that. He had a controller who was basically taking care of the books, and he was padding the books. Happens all the time. And, of course, they always say, well, I could trust them. So internal controls is important. But let me tell you the story. So I said, you need to hire an expert in your field and have them look at what we're doing and tell us is the percentage of materials being used as a percentage of sales on the job, appropriate. And guess what they found? A, the process we had was wasting materials. They were over-applying, in effect, the materials, wasting it, putting on five inches when three inches was more than enough. Right. And not getting paid for it. Number two, we were able to interview people, and one confessed that they were doing work on the side with our materials. And as I said, but it wasn't much as they all say. And they were right because they were only a fraction of all the other people who were doing it because it became so obvious and almost like a fringe benefit. They're not going to wear the equipment out any much sooner. They're not taking that much material, although the material, even in small quantities, was worth a lot of money. And so what did we do after fixing it? Within moments, if you will, margin increased by 5%. Now, given that they were only working on a bottom line, which for their industry was great, of 8%, what is 5% wow. compared to 8%? That's a big jump. Whoa. It was huge, as they say. And this is a real story. And what was the point? Here was a small business owner. He was a contractor guy, not formally educated, knew nothing about accounting. Being a, He knew how to make his product, if you will, and run a crew. And he wouldn't listen. You and I had this problem. One of us had a problem with our 
sound system here on this microphone. Yes. And kept saying to the other, your internet connection isn't as fast as mine. <laughs> but we're not going to go there. No, we're not going to go there because. And we, I'm not going to say who it was. Mine is faster than yours, but that's another story. <laughs> well, you know, Stan, it's funny. I got my first accounting lesson when I was about 10. We had a luncheonette in my neighborhood, and I had go there and get something for my dad, and I got to be good friends with the guy who ran it and the like, and I noticed he had a cigar box under his counter, not a cash register, a cigar box. And I said to him one day, Nate, what's that box for? And he said, that's my business. I said, oh? He said, yeah. I start out with a certain amount during the day. I pay for things during the day, and I take money in. At the end of the day, if there's more money in there than I brought, I made money. If there's less, I didn't. And that, boys and girls, is what cash is all about. And you can have all the financial statements in the world, but at the end of the day, cash is always king. And I know you're going to have some great war stories on that, Lonnie, but let me go back, if I may, to margins, increasing profits. So how many of our listeners analyze their financial statements beyond looking at the bottom line and maybe the top line and not the in the middle. And so one of the things I did that grew my practice, frankly, is developing a reputation as not the bean counter, but the analyst, in effect, that I could look at numbers and they were like people telling me what to tell the client to increase their profitability and their sales and maybe even make changes in pricing. So I will break from what we said of not teaching accounting today and bring up a couple of principles. One's called costs and they're fixed or they're variable or they could be maybe a little bit combination of both so fixed costs might be a rent that no matter how much you have on space let's say 10,000 square foot you might be able to double your sales within the space you have because simply you have more capacity than you knew and then you have the variable costs like the labor like the material and some other factors now I'm sure all of our audience knows that and they're yawning already but my question is When's the last time you did that analysis to compute the break-even point? And stop right now, listeners. If you don't know what break-even point means, have that conversation with your accountant. And if they can't blow you away in that discussion and have you go, whoa, there's things I need to do, you need to rethink whether you have the firm or the partner or staff person in charge serving you because that's old hat to us bean counters. And it's a moneymaker. Break-even point is the amount of sales you need to generate no loss nor profit. But the point of it is that tool is a killer for helping you to be more effective in pricing your product. And pricing doesn't come from costs. It comes from knowing your competition. But you got to know your costs also because you know what? Your competition who could have 10 times your capital can put you out of business because you didn't know your costs. Any comment on that? Yeah. I mean, too many small businesses base price on a what I guess we'd call the follow the leader method or run faster than your closest competitor. Don't emulate competitors that way. Because I know in a previous podcast, I talked about emulating your competition. Not that way. What you've got to do is know that what your cost structure is and what you can afford you can't make products loss leaders like a major player can. They can make it a loss leader because they want to sell a more profitable product into that customer. So they know their costs down to the penny. You have to be the same way because you'll find the niche where they can't play. And you'll use that cost element to price better. Well, you know, Lonnie... The one area I see accountants and salespeople, professional salespeople converge is on the statement, you got to ask the right questions. Yep. What more powerful selling technique than asking the right questions? Well, when it comes to improving your business, it's not so much that we know all the answers as consultants. We just got the right questions because frankly, the people who generally have the answers or the clients themselves or their employees. Absolutely. And the important thing here to understand is no two clients are the same. They could be in the exact same business 
be the exact same size and because of certain internal or external situations are 180 degrees different in how they approach things, et cetera. So it's, you can't copy costs. Okay, that's... Well, no, continue. I didn't mean to cut you off. Guys. Yeah, go ahead. No, I just want to give you a chance to get back to your love, which is cash flow. So maybe you can give us some insights that you were thinking before well, I cut you off earlier. The interesting thing is that I was talking before about cash flow with the cigar box. Well, the cigar box is a basis because at the end of the day, what's important is cash. And in all the turnarounds I've ever done, the first thing I did was implement a thing I call an eight-week rolling cash flow forecast. Because eight weeks is about as far as you can see. And basically what it is, is what's coming in the next eight weeks and what's going out in the next eight weeks. And there's certain things you've got to pay every week or every month and they fit in. But this way, you know where you're going to be a little short and you may have to move some stuff. When I was doing turnarounds, I had to do this where I'm going to suppliers and saying, we're going to have to unfortunately put you on 45 or 60 days for the next 90 because we're in a cash shortage, et cetera. And then on the other side, it's go collect as fast as you can. Offer terms, 210, 2% that discount 10 days payment. And also hold your customers to that. That's cash is king in that regard. And that's the thing that you got to kind of get your head around that one because I love that cash is king thing. Yeah. I mean, this is, I love that. It's an old phrase, but it works. It's still the same. I mean, that's the whole idea here. Well, Stan, while we're at it though, help them because there are things in your business you can look at that are, and every business is different with this. They're called KPIs, which are key performance indicators. And every business is a little bit different. But Stan, talk about the key performance indicators that they should be looking at to ensure that they're on target. And one of those could be gross profit. Another one could be collection days, et cetera. If you have more than four or five, you got too many. But yeah, sure. God, sorry, just go yeah, no, right exactly. in. And sure. see, we interrupt each other all the time because it's just well, the way. Com- this is a Cracker Barrel conversation. It is. I mean, this is the way we are. So <laughs> deal with it. It's just like we meet. Deal with it. Alone. That's right. So I can't help but backtrack a moment, and I will get to the KPI. So you said Cash and King. The one I love is I used to do a radio on TV, a local station, for about six months, the business doctor interview. And then we'd have a tip in the interviewer, the host. And he said, Well, if cash is Kingston, what's an ace? I said, Jack, more cash. (laughs) (laughs) And Lonnie, I have an interesting piece of information from you. Do you know it's hard to collect on time if the bills don't go out on time? Yes. I had a medical practice where the bookkeeper decided it was convenient for her just to do all the bills at one time. Yes. (laughs) We'd be a week behind before we even started. And see, that's... Interesting thing is that the bill ought to go out almost the second the sales come in. You get the sale, invoice goes out. It doesn't matter whether you're 10 million, 1 million, or 500,000. Do that and you'll save yourself a lot of cash because it's sitting on some clerk's desk. And then the second thing is, Here's a question for all of you to go and answer. Find out, you know, if you've got a collection problem, everybody's got those periodically. Find out what the average days are, the collection, but then go look on the other side. How quickly do you pay bills when they come in? Trust me, there's a difference between accounts payable and accounts receivable and the people who, for some reason, kind of migrate to those positions. And that is that Most of the time, payables are paid within 15 days. And if your collections are at 75, what's wrong with this picture? I think my math says you're short two months of cash flow. Hello. So back to your KPIs, since you forced me to do that. All right. So what you're going to learn is every industry has pretty much defined KPIs. You can 
Look them up. Talk to your trade association. But they're there. You don't have to invent them. They're not the same for every industry. And you'll also find many times the KPI that you're looking at isn't something you're going to see on your balance sheet, which tells you what your assets and liabilities are, your equity, or on your profit and loss or statement of income, as we call it. Sometimes there are other things. So, for example, you're not going to see sales backlog on your financial statement. You're going to see sales, but that's history. So let me give you a perfect example of how we use that to price. So I had this 10-person machine shop, which grew in five years when I took it over with the client to 100 people. You're going to say, that's BS. Oh, no. This was during huge growth times, a lot of federal contracts. This was machine shop operation, and they were fabulous at producing effectively. And the one partner, there was two partners, was fabulous at selling and his art, Lon, you'll love, was the upsell. He would quote to the spec. This is governmental in many cases. And he had the ability to, from the knowledge of his partner who ran the production, he was able to show them ways to, in effect, re-engineer the thing to significantly reduce the cost. And the salesperson, the other partner, was able to convince them, what you can imagine when a mountain that is the climb to make those changes. You can just picture what they would have to go through to get people to even do it if they wanted to because of the hierarchy, but they did it. They were incredible. At up, you know, somebody came to you, Lonnie, to fix their bat and they went from single to double and they were happy with the other coach. They come to you and now what used to be a double is a triple or a home run. You're like, Why? whoa. And you go, well, it's just you weren't doing the way I taught you. So it happens here. They say, listen, they have the ability with all the channels and all the communication challenges, let alone decision-making, to do this is an actual true story. But here was the point. Because I convinced them to do something that even was almost impossible to do then on computers, the sophistication, their intuitive ability to look at the backlog, not just by sales dollars, but by machine center, how much is in the lathe department, how much is the milling department, the drilling They had this uncanny ability to convert that knowledge of the status of the workload, if you will, so that if they had machine centers that would have been actually not used, which is money down the drain, that they would adjust their pricing to load the machine, knowing what I taught them, their break-even analysis, so that we had this term called marginal contribution to overhead, meaning beyond the direct cost of producing this, will I cover some of my overhead? Interesting. And that's a marginal contribution. And that is a great way. You don't make the same margin, but you don't make nothing, as we say yeah. in the old country. And it's very interesting. I mean, I talked about the turnaround stuff that I do, but every time I manage the company, I'm a pretty simple guy when it comes to this stuff. I had three reports that were all I cared about. One was an eight-week cash flow forecast that I talked about. The other was backlog, which Stan talked about. And Backlog tells you a lot just looking at it, as Stan has so nicely described with the machine shop. And then the last one was 30, 60, 90 day sales forecast. And with this one, the important thing, of course, is that the sales forecast has credibility. Just a sidebar, I will note this. Most of the time, I've heard from financial people, and I want Stan to answer this. The forecast isn't big enough. We don't have enough prospects on our forecast. So it's kind of like, okay, well, then we'll just convert some of the suspects into prospects. Just move over in the category. <laughs> no, you don't sleep with your sales forecast under your pillow. And it's got to have credibility. So the way we used to do it was if it hit 30 days, that meant we'd start building. We we're ready. So that in 30 days, we're ready to ship that sucker. Scare the bejesus out of salespeople? You betcha. But they knew we were serious about forecasting because forecasting is the lifeblood of cash flow because it's when now that starts, that goes into backlog, backlog then becomes when it comes out of backlog is when we bill it and then we start to collect it. There's the process. KPIs could be as simple as three reports. KPIs could be something special. And the only thing I take exception with is that I think every business has their own set of KPIs. They may be some industry ones and the like, but every business has a different set of them. And that can be true depending on the industry because sometimes size can actually be a differentiator, if only for the issue of 
technology. You know, a small business is going to be less likely to be automating some things than a larger business has the sales volume to support the automation. Absolutely. So, Lonnie, I hate to tell you, but we're actually almost near the end of the time. This is a topic I'm sure our audience would love more on. And if they do, I hope that they'll let us know because it's huge. And I think there's so much opportunity here. Again, our goal is not to act as teachers. We know you know these things. The question is, how well are you using these things? I mean, I think what you have done, though, is I think you've given a greater appreciation for the importance and value to our audience of getting the small business owners that are out there to better understand and manage their money and use their accounting firm to help drive that bus for them. I hope the listeners are impacted just as much as in other weeks. This is a really important topic because it does, in fact, drive your business. And as always, we welcome your feedback because – This could be all we do on a topic until we get a request to go deeper. And we'd love to go deeper. Oh, Stan would. Now, that's when I will bring a pillow. When he starts to go deeper on money, I'm bringing a pillow. I restrain myself. Lonnie, before we close out this podcast session, let's do a 30-second recap. Knowing more about your numbers beyond the top and bottom line or what's on the financial statements can increase your cash flow and profits, but also help you improve your pricing decisions avoid missing sales opportunities, or avoid bad ones, and give you the slight edge over your competition. Small business owners often underutilize their internal and external accountants and should seek more from them than being historians and tax return preparers. Asking the right questions is critical to good analysis, and that can be done as one of their roles. And lastly, we talked about cash flow and how cash is king and more cash is an ace but also such things as break-even point, cost analysis, and other things that, as I said earlier, should be things that your outside accountants and perhaps your internal accountants should also be talking and asking questions about. Just send us a note at info at SB Virtual Roundtables, all one word, dot com. This is Lonnie Shambi, and for my partner, Stan Simpkins, we thank you for joining us today. Be sure to check us out at our website for our calendar of topics and a guest invitation to one of our virtual roundtables at www.sbvirtualroundtables.com. You've been listening to the Small Business Wake Up Call, the podcast providing eye opening insights and perhaps a caffeine high to better run your business, delivered in Stan Simpkins and Lonnie Shambi's own unique style. Head on over to sbvirtualroundtables.com where you can connect with Lonnie and Stan, subscribe to the show, find more resources, and check out their monthly 90-minute virtual roundtables. Thanks for listening to the Small Business Wake-Up Call. 